heat into the river. And then somebody came up with the idea, well, let's just make a pipe to the city and use it for heating buildings. But because the pipe was so expensive, I mean, it's really a mega, 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 mega in, uh, investment, um, they created laws. So any new building project is obliged to connect to the district heating to, to make this pre-investment uh, feasible. And they don't have their own boilers, right? Yeah, they don't, uh, yeah. And it's high temperature, it's, uh, it's 90 degrees. Um, so that comes into buildings, and this, this is the Rotterdam Airport, and um, they're going to expand with a, a whole housing office kind of complex here. So it's an incredibly huge uh, uh, investment uh, to connect all this new pro program. I don't think you can see it very clearly, but this is where you would need to connect it from the inner city of Rotterdam to, to this area, and you need to dig up the streets. So it's a huge, huge investment. And uh, what we said was, well, we've got this high line. It's actually called the Hofboge. We've got this high line that follows exactly the same trajectory. So if we incorporate the district heating in the roof of the high line, can't we use the, save, the, the saved costs for, from digging up the streets to create a park? So you can actually cycle to the airport from the inner city or skate to the airport from the inner city of Rotterdam. Mm -hmm. So... Um, uh, we, we did some uh, research. Uh, it's a very simple concept. Basically, you've got the, you've got the existing infrastructure. You need two pipes. <laughs> That's all. They have a diameter of this. You can incorporate them in the roof of uh, the Hofbogen. You can use them to heat buildings. But um, with absorption chillers, you can also use that really high temperature to create cool. You can cool buildings using high temperature. You can invert it. So you can use it to cool buildings. And basically what it means is that the, the different housing associations and building owners along this trajectory can actually connect into this new infrastructure. So they can also um, uh, make the, the sustainability steps that they need. And the saved costs we use to create our own high line. We don't get Diller and Scofidio uh, to design it. We get uh, Dupal Strijkers uh, to do it. <laughs> Might not be quite as good, but uh, it will at least be local. Um, and one of, the, one of the key aspects is that this, this project goes over the highway and uh, then you see the short-sightedness of planners. They've just demolished this part of, um, of the trajectory. And that's really... Uh, so if we do ever realize it, we need to rebuild the connection over the highway. And we calculated what it would mean um, and it's a, feasible, it's a completely feasible, feasible business case. So the proposal is completely feasible. The problem is that you've got so many different uh, entities. The owner of the roof is a different one to the owner of the spaces underneath. There are three housing corporations involved. Um, so it's a, an incredibly uh, complicated project and probably it will, it will die uh, in politics as most projects, as most ideas do. Um, also on a larger scale, a project in the Merve Viehavens, which is where those three towers are. Here we were asked to come up with a, uh, an idea for a sustainable uh, neighborhood in 2040. Um, basically, uh, a free, a, a free uh, thinking project, um, a future vision. We're here at the RDM. This is the Merve Viehavens. This is actually a map of the Stadshavens. Maybe you've seen it already, this map. Um, should look familiar. So, uh, I think you've been to the Rheinhaven, which is over here. Um, uh, that's where there's uh, some really interesting work. And this project is really in the, the Merve Viehavens, which um, currently is a very monofunctional area. Really a lot of storage of juice and uh, fruit. And a couple of really, the Haka building is there. A couple of kind of iconic buildings. Um, but the area is going to be, uh, a lot of the buildings will be demolished because, you know, we, you went out to the stormwater search, to the Maasvlakte, that whole reclamation, that's space for all of the industrial pro uh, companies here. So they're going to house out of the city. They're going to move to those locations, which means we're going to have a huge uh, development potential on this site in the coming 20 years. And basically what we did in this project was we looked at um, district development. Um, uh, you're, you're all familiar with traditional district development, which is based on land values. Um, in, in Holland, due to the crisis, we're really rethinking the way in which we do district development. Um, 
and one of the ideas is um, to start looking at district development much more in terms of services. So how can you place the end user central, that's the starting point, and how can you link different services, energy, water, mobility, data, healthcare, etc., etc., food production, how can you link these in really smart ways um, to generate uh, value and from out, from, from out this value to generate uh, buildings, not first buildings and then functions, first functions and then buildings. And um, that means, um, well, you're all familiar with the ESCOs, uh, Energy Service uh, Corporation idea. If you were to extrapolate that idea radically as a, on, a, on a district development uh, scale, and you were to start thinking about food production as well, about water production as well, and other services, what kind of economic model could you imagine? Uh, and one of the ideas is that maybe um, uh, communities could be shareholders in a district development so that you're you, you're you, you're part of you owner you're part owner of the the, the the development and i don't really know how these models could work but it's it is something that we're thinking about yeah right. um so basically what we said was the old system is you've got an area you calculate the land value and then you work out how many houses how many offices etc you need to build and we said well we don't do that let's come up with a sustainable concept and see what the area can sustain uh, so we reversed it. One of the key issues is that this area is um, unembanked. So we need to look at the, this is the existing dike. We need to look at some kind of strategy for dealing with that. And what we did was we uh, created a climate proof park. So we raised the area slightly. And uh, because the area has a lot of district heating, we said, well, let's expand on the district heating. And if you combine district heating heat with certain bacteria, you can also remediate soil. Uh, don't ask me how it works, but I've heard that this is true, so we just assume. Well, okay, we do soil remediation with bacteria and heat. Great, great idea. Um, quickly to run you through the, the three steps of the, the REAP strategy to, run, to round it off as well. The first is to reduce. So what we tried to do was develop a, a low energy urban morphology based on bioclimatic design principles. Um, of course, any low energy urban morphology is also based on <laughs> pedestrians and cyclists. So the point of departure is the, the human being and uh, a, 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 let's say a pedestrian scale. Um, and we looked at mobility, um, optimizing mobility using, uh, it's a bit of a complicated map, but basically it has a very good infrastructure on the land side. And by complementing that with an infrastructure on the water side, we could make any point of the whole <coughs> site um, accessible to the inner city within 10 minutes by in, in, in introducing a new water infrastructure. You all came on the boat, uh, well, basically a water boat, we call it a water tech, uh, water bus. I'm not sure if you guys use that word. It's water taxi. Me, water taxi. Water buses. Um, the second step was really looking at a, an urban morphology based on uh, climate and comfort. So what we did was we took the, the building block, the Rotterdam building block, which is a topology uh, of about four stories uh, with a, co a collective gardens or individual gardens. And then by parametrically linking these to each other uh, and to, to different um, aspects of climate, um, public space, uh, we morphed the, 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 the urban configuration. So, for example, at uh, points where there are public transport nodes, the density increases, but there's a limit based on our own parameters. For example, um, that you still have acoustic contact with the ground is a parameter, and, and you also reach a certain kind of optimum. So there's nothing is more than eight to nine stories in this development. So it's a low-rise, high-density urban model with uh, a large diversity in building typologies. The buildings are orientated to the sun. Every, every dwelling has three hours of sunlight as a minimum criteria. And by shifting the blocks in relation to each other, we can also optimize the way in which the wind moves over the, over the area. So the wind, there's no sudden jumps in the urban landscape. The wind moves over the area. It, it uh, recirculates the air in the, in the streets. And we create low pressures on the, on the west and the, and the south facades which are perfect places for terraces, uh, for having a beer. Mm -hmm. So you create the opportunities for, for certain kind of urban programs. 
Uh, the second uh, aspect is, uh, is exchange. So um, we looked at obviously industrial ecology as a principle. Uh, you have certain kind of industrial processes in the area. Which kind of complementary processes could you imagine that make use of the waste streams? Really simple. And, uh, and the second aspect was the idea of a heat cascade. Um, we just spoke about the district heating. So on a city scale, we have waste heat coming in at 90 degrees. If you look at the new buildings that we make, they are all low temperature buildings, that means with floor heating, for example. They only need 40 degrees or 30 degrees. So new housing, offices or supermarkets, schools only needs 30 to 40 degrees. So it doesn't make really much sense to use 90 degrees for a function that needs 30 degrees. There's a huge differential. So what we do is we, talk, we look at a heat cascade and we try to use um, the right temperature for the right program. That's optimal use of the energy that we have. So we use 90 degrees for industrial processes, for hot water, for heating radiators in uh, old buildings, monuments, for absorption chilling, so for creating cool, or for storage. Um, the, pro the, the temperature that comes out of those processes is 60 degrees that we use in greenhouses. It comes out of 40 degrees, we use that for housing, for offices, for supermarkets, for schools. That comes out of 30 degrees, we use that for swimming pools and for urban agriculture in the form of fish farming. So it's a kind of a very logical cascading. But if you were to think about this in, as an, an urban planner, then you would think you get this kind of concentric urban plan. So industry in this, the opposite of, of how the garden city, industry in the center, and then in concentric rings you get uh, programs. That doesn't make much sense if you think about the way in which we inhabit and use cities. So um, I think you had the question, what kind of infrastructure do you need to actually make the match? Um, we call it an inframedian. It's a mediator between infrastructures. Uh, it doesn't exist, but it's something that we can design together. Um, basically, an inframedian uh, can uh, exchanges. In this case, it's, an, it's a heat exchanger that stores heat, but also actually uh, exchanges heat and cold of different temperatures in a, in a kind of star-shaped fashion, which means it's very flexible. So you can respond to existing urban programmatic configurations as opposed to just an energy configuration. Uh, the last aspect is um, producing energy, water and food. Um, one of the aspects uh, that we're looking at is optimizing the use of sun uh, energy. Um, in this context, wind energy doesn't make much sense, but sun does. But we don't have that many surfaces. So this is a concept for a football field that is uh, an energy, it's a sun uh, farm during the day and the whole floor twists over and it's a football field in the evenings when the sun's not there. It sounds far-fetched but it's actually been built in Sliedrecht. Um, uh, a lot of the, the local football clubs don't have enough money um, and this is a way of turning a local football club into an energy producer. Uh, so it's an interesting way of, of it also has a social aspect. Another aspect is if you take this idea and you start thinking about buildings and surfaces of buildings, if, you're, if, if you have a housing program uh, during the day when the sun is shining on the south facade, no one's at home. Uh, why can't your facade generate energy? This is an idea for a multifunctional uh, facade that um, produces energy, uh, reflects heat, uh, absorbs uh, CO2, or can be used uh, as an ad advertising. So it's actually just an idea about multifunctional surface exploitation. There's a company in Holland called Sublime who is seriously developing this. There's a company this in Germany that has that. Yeah. Yeah, that we expect. It's a triangular shaped thing that yeah. runs on pivots. Yeah, Sublime. You know, we work, we work, it's a, it's a Dutch company. Oh, it is? Sublime, yeah. We worked with them on the development of it. And basically, it's a triangle that yeah, twists. Exactly. And one side is PV, the yeah. other side is LED. moss for absorbing mm -hmm. uh, CO2, and the other side can be uh, lead or uh, reflective. The last aspect is, is water, uh, how to produce uh, water and come up with smart uh, uh, systems, uh, cycling systems. One of the things that trees do, of course, is um, they, they have condensation, they, they evaporate water. So we did an experiment um, some years ago in a park where we just wrapped one branch of a tree in, in plastic. And uh, during one day it produced about a liter or one and a half liters of clean drinking water. It's an interesting idea. Um, and if you were to do that on a large scale in greenhouses, closed greenhouses, then your greenhouses are producing drinking water and heat. 
the heat we can use in our energy system, the drinking water we can drink. In Holland, it's, it's, it's not legal to make your own drinking water. In Germany, it is. Um, but in the future, we will be able to make our own drinking water as well. And then, obviously, we have a, a grey system for um, uh, re recycling the, the grey water. We have a black water system for producing our biogas and fertilizers for the greenhouses. And the public domain is designed as a square. You must have been to the water square tomorrow? Not yet. Tomorrow, okay. Well, you will love it. Um, basically, the idea is that the, well, you know the idea, using the public space as a water buffer. Um, in this case, we designed the whole public space as water retention. So that's the whole public space is designed as a sponge. Mm. Uh, makes absolute sense. Mm -hmm. And it results in a very green uh, uh, environment. The last, last aspect is food production. I won't take too much time. Uh, in, this, in, this, in this case, we could make six hectares of industrial greenhouses. Um, we calculated that it doesn't make sense to, to use, to, to, it's not economically viable to do urban agriculture in less than one hectare. So we, we got uh, six hectares of vertical greenhouses and, and a fish farm. And basically what we did, to finish off last slide, uh, we looked at this whole model for an urban development with its own morphology and its own uh, ambitions. And we said, well, how many people could it sustain? It could sustain 25,000 people. Uh, you have an energy demand for housing and for mobility. You have a water demand and a food demand. We didn't look at meat. We only looked at fish and fruits and vegetables. And basically, by smart de design, we could reduce the demand. By exchange, we could reduce it even more. And we had our own production in situ. And theoretically, in this model, we calculated that we, we could have a surplus of energy, food, and water. That means that the idea of a, a neighborhood where you're a part owner or shareholder uh, in not just an energy service corporation, but also food and water, um, theoretically, in this model, could be viable. Um, we're not sure exactly how you would organize that and what it means for the, the traditional roles of all of the parties um, involved. But it's uh, a notion that we are seriously considering and we think that it will be taken more and more seriously in light of the current crisis and the, the developments that we see happening on a larger scale in terms of district development in the Netherlands. And I think I should leave it at that because there are all kinds of people coming in. <laughs> I'm not sure exactly what's going to happen.